Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name is Tim. I'm an alcoholic. Very glad to be here. I don't speak for AA. Uh, if anything I say bothers you, I wouldn't worry about it. Um, I'm going to go straight in with this. Um, the starting point is step nine. Well, you, you've got to have done step eight. So what have you got? You've got a list of the people you've harmed. Um, the way I do that list to get clear uh, I've got to have a picture of exactly what I did. No flim flam, no backstory, no, but I felt, but I didn't intend just the thing itself. What did I do? Um, plus an understanding of who suffered and how. So that's that's another topic, how to do step eight. The starting point of step nine is having that list. And then what step nine is, um, as with all the other steps, Uh, We're used to seeing the steps on the wall scrolls in meetings, and we're used to seeing them on page 59 of the big book. They're not the steps. Uh, They're the the titles of the steps. The step, the full form of the step, is the contents of the big book on that step. Uh, One of the prefaces, I think the third preface says as much, the steps which summarize our program. So you've got a a title of the step, and then you've got the actual step. And the title on page 59 is made direct amends to such people wherever possible, except when to do so would injure them or others. So let's just, I'm just going to look at the wording to start off with. Made direct amends to such people. Uh, Who are such people? Well, you've got to look back at step eight for that. Made list of all persons we had harmed and became willing to make amends to them all. And it's always amazed me when when I've done step eight lists, I've got loads of people on there, loads of them. And I'm not even particularly unpleasant. I mean, I can be unpleasant, but I'm not. I'm I'm not out there in terms of huge amounts of criminal action. I've got loads of people. And I've talked to people who've been in recovery for a long time who are fudged. Uh, well, one of the questions I always ask is, did you complete your amends? And they say, oh, yes, both of them. I'm like, oh, Jesus, you mean you've only negatively affected two people in your whole life? No! Yeah. 2, 10, 20 is a bit slim. Um, All persons we had harmed. Uh, Anyone I've affected negatively, which has left a residue behind it, needs to be dealt with, and that's a lot of people. Um, And we're already willing by step nine. Step eight became willing to make amends to them all. What what are amends? Well, I'll go into lots of detail with quotations from the big book, but basically you, you, you grab the person, you explain what you're doing. What are you doing? You're making amends. Uh, what do you then do? What I do is I admit what I did wrong. I did this. I did that. I shouldn't have done it. I regret doing it. Uh, if applicable, I'll ask for forgiveness. Uh, that's not one of my usual cards I play. Some people play that card. I don't. I don't want to ask anything back. But you can you can request forgiveness. That that's kosher. What can I do to set this straight? Is a good question. Uh, well, I, I might as well say it now because I'll forget. If they're crazy, don't ask them. Uh, because otherwise they'll ask you to do some crazy whack job stuff and you're going to have to, I'm going to speak to my sponsor about that and get back to you. Just to, if you don't give them the chance to ask you to do something wacko, then you're not in a position I have to say no to them. So you say, what can I do to set this straight when you're making amends to a grown up who is of sound mind and non-hysterical? So that kind of narrows it down. 
And then there's some follow through action. So that's what the amends are. I'll, there'll be more detail on that uh, later on. Um, uh, so made direct amends, made direct amends. Uh, now, this is very widely misunderstood. I mean, I, 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 don't, I don't think I make any friends really by doing these talks because half of what I say contradicts the, the bulk of what you get on a lot of speaker tapes. Uh, but there is a, a cultural um, tradition in certain parts of the world to say if the amend is not in person, it doesn't count. And they say... Did you harm them in a letter? Well, if you didn't harm them in a letter, you can't make amends in a letter. Um, and that's an approach. And that's a view. But what does the step actually say? It, say, it says direct. It doesn't say in person. The phrase in person was available in 1939. It was not chosen. They chose direct. Direct means to them, not by generally being nice, but directly to them. Now, how you make it directly to them, when you look at the actual text, it gives examples of face-to-face -face amends. It gives examples of standing up in church. It gives examples of conversations. It also gives examples of letters. That the book's doing that. That's not me saying that. The book says there are situations where an amend is better in writing. We'll come to where those... Actually, I might as well just say now. There are certain situations, if, I, if I've been out of touch with someone, then I'm going to want to do it in writing. I'll come to the approach in a minute. But I don't know about you. I knew, I knew some real crazy fudges over the years. If you tried to make amends by having a conversation with them, they would steamroll, bulldoze, divert onto another topic and start attacking you back. And you have no chance to even get the amend out because it's now turned into some Barnum and Bailey production number about some old grievance. You, you can't have the conversation with some people. A lot of people you, you just can't have a rational conversation with. The only way to get the message across clearly without interruption, deviation or hesitation is to do it in writing. Uh, there are situations with exes where they're now married, where you do not want to be knocking on their door and have the husband answer, but you can write a respectful letter. So there are lots and lots of situations where letters are suitable. The step is made direct amends and in person is very good, but it's not the only way of doing it. It depends on the circumstances. The book is also very clear. Uh, so there's this rule that it has to be in person. The book says there are no rules. That's the book's, again, that's the book saying that. It says there are innumerable situations. It's very wise. It is non-prescriptive about step nine. It says you have to do it, but you have to judge each situation differently. We've also got the question, I can see just on the screen in front of me, there are people from different cultures. Amends conversations go down very differently in the UK than they do in America. Um, the levels of cynicism about spiritual stuff, <laughs> um, there have been very, very bad reactions to amend types that go down very well in the States. So there are cultural things to take into account there. If you're in France or the Netherlands, you don't want to be mentioning the fact you're on a mission from God. Um, they'll call the police at that point in Amsterdam or Paris. Uh, in Paris, you'll get some extra eye rolling. In Holland, they'll just blank you. Uh, but you'll get the eye, the shrugs, the everything, the sighing, uh, whew, all of that, the puffs. Per, the Parisian puff. You, you've got to take into account the culture of the people that you're making amends to. So it's got to be a. Pre, it's about them. It's not about you. It's about restoring the relationships with them. So you don't want to go in like a crazy coot with this stuff. Um, where am I? So the, this notion of direct amends. A lot of people, if they're in my life, you can hijack them. You grab them at the meeting as they're wolfing a 
custard cream say can i have a couple of minutes i owe you an apology you take them aside you set it straight and you're done uh in domestic situations you can do that i've had friends i just call them up there are people you can do that when the relationship is so ruptured that um and that and especially if the harm harms are of a certain type you don't want to be just uh hijacking them, putting them on the spot, interrupting them. Uh, I approach people in writing saying, I would like to make amends. For Sometimes I'll say I'd like to make amends and then leave it to the amend situation to go into detail. Sometimes I'll do the whole amend in the approach, in the written approach, say, I would love to talk to you about this face-to-face, on the phone, video call, whatever, Uh, But I'll leave it up to you. The book talks about tact and consideration. Um, Some people who've who've wanted to make amends to me over the years, I'm very pleased. It's not many, but I'm pleased. I'm pleased they're going to do it. It doesn't mean I want sometimes what people do is say, you get this message from someone you haven't spoken to in five years and they say, hey, would you like to meet for a coffee? I mean, it's in a WhatsApp, so that's not the tone, but you're like, I last saw you in 2012. Why do you want to You want to meet me for a coffee? What's your game, Buster? Um, so I don't, I don't like surprises. A lot of people don't like so if, if you're not in contact with them, if they're not calling you, they don't want to talk to you. That's why they don't call you. So don't presume that they're going to want the conversation. You offer them the amend. Very often, the reason they don't want to talk to you is because you owe them amends. You're on their list of people not to talk to. So you've got to go in tactfully. You say, I want to make amends. In the approach, you say exactly what you're doing. I want to make amends. I have no ulterior motive. Uh, it, and one thing you can do, if you don't know you're going to hear back, you can say, um, you may not want to hear from me. This may be a very well, unwelcome missive coming through to you, but I want to make amends. I'm very glad to. If I don't hear from you, I'm just going to send it through in writing and then you can read it or delete it or do whatever you want because that saves you having to pester them for a response. You just warn them you're going to be sending something. That 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 is administratively simpler as well. So either I grab the person, I call them, or I make this approach and then follow through with the approach. When they come back, they say, yes, call me at this time, or I'll see you at this meeting, or send me a letter, or whatever, I follow through. Now, the thorny topic is the accept when to do so would injure them or others. And... In a fellowship where the levels of arrant nonsense can sometimes be eye-watering, the interpretations of this phrase take the biscuit. And we're going to come come some examples of that. In a way which does no one any favours, as I said, my question to people who are, you know, 20 years sober and spending a little bit too much time, you know, in in the... uh, Uh, less salubrious dens of London, Uh, the question is how, you know, did you complete your amends and then it's half a dozen? The fact is what they did, they'll have had a a whacking step eight list, but their sponsor will have carved off whole areas of people not to make it, things not to make amends for. And you're left with kind of four polite amends letters to distant cousins. And that's kind of it. And so there's a huge amount of co-signing of not making amends in AA under this caption, except when to do so would injure them or others. So we've got to understand what this even means and then set the, set the criteria for what it means based on what is in the book and then test our step eights against it. And I can tell you, in my experience, I... I there were se- I made several dozen formal amends in around, I got sober in 93, several dozen formal amends in 93, 94, uh, several dozen formal amends about 15, 14 years later, 13, 14 years later. Uh, and there have been dribs and drabs in between as well. Uh, and there have been, so there have been lots of situations where, where I've had to make amends. 
Um, and I'm kind of run of the mill. I, I'm not even, I'm not particularly wicked. There are people with 100, people 700, 800. Um, and I found it in my list vanishingly rare for that clause, except when to do so would injure them or others, vanishingly rare that that clause can get invoked. And I'll explain why. First of all, it says injure. Um, we have to know a little bit about Bill. Bill was taught by some grade school teacher, don't use the same word twice. Uh, so we've got, you know, in step five, we've got the exact nature of our wrongs. In step six, we've got, we've got defects, we've got shortcomings. Here we've got harm, suddenly we've got injure. It's the same thing. So you can read step nine to say, uh, made direct amends to such people wherever possible, except when to do so would harm them or others. Basically, you've got to look on balance. Is this endeavor, the step nine endeavor, going to improve the net situation? or So is the net situation going to improve or is it going to deteriorate? You're looking at the whole situation in the round. Is it going to be better? Is it going to be worse? If it if it's going to be better, you do it. If it's not going to be better, you don't. Um, there are three situations I've identified from the book, and, and it's all, we'll come to those when I read out the quotations, where the amend, as described above, could cause harm. And it's really the first one covers uh, the other two. Basically, it's revealing new information. If they know you did it, if they know what you did and they know what did it, an apology can cause no harm to anyone. It's Im impossible for someone's life to be made materially worse by receiving a heartfelt, sincere, well-worded, formal, respectful apology. This can damage no one unless there is new information. The new information could be about the content. It could be about the identity. Uh, specifically, um, uh, the two ways in which that could happen. You can, in revealing new information, you can set in motion trains of circumstances. Uh, for instance, in a corporate environment, you could be sacked for something. Uh, in the area of criminal law, you could be prosecuted because new information has been revealed. If the information is known and nothing has been done about it, apologizing is not going to cause a problem. Um, I've never, I've, my life has never been made worse by someone apologizing to me. I've been annoyed by it, but that's different. Sometimes it's annoying because of the way it's done or the timing, but I can't be harmed. I'll tell you, however, some people, I remember someone tried to make amends to me a few years ago. I don't wonder if they'll ever hear this tape. Um, they said, uh, I, I didn't know them, never heard, that they were the girlfriend of a, of a sponsee, a former sponsee. She said, I want to make amends to you. Uh, you used to sponsor my ex-boyfriend. And she said, and I said, I don't know who you are. <laughs> I don't even recognize the name. And she said, well, I need to make amends to you because I've been bad-mouthing you to the whole of East London AA. And I was like, I did not know that. This is new information. I now have a different perception of what has been going on in East London AA. Now, I didn't, I didn't particularly care. Uh, but there are people who really would. You, you want to be careful saying something like that. What's the problem? New information. Um, plenty of people have bad mouthed me. I've got a big mouth. So if you've got a big mouth, you're going to get bad mouthed. It comes with the territory. The destination is printed clearly on that ticket. And so I know, I know who I know. Some people who bad mouth me. If they, none of them have apologized. But if one of them did, I'd be great. But, but no harm could be done by that because I know they did what they did. It's fine. I'm already over. It. It's like I don't care. I'm fine. The third thing I don't want to involve third parties. 
don't drag anyone else into this. The typical example is crime involving, involving several people, Complic particularly crime involving complicity. Um, so depending on your step eight, there could be loads of those or there could be none of those. Um, just looking at, at whether it would harm someone, uh, one, of, one of the things that people sometimes say is you don't want to reopen old wounds. You don't want to re Now, that sounds like a really bad thing to do. Like, if you had a physical wound which was healed, you wouldn't get a knife and open it up again. That's really clear. But the problem here is that's a really bad image for what is going on here. First of all, if you, uh, if you say, well, that's our test, I shall make amends unless to do so would be to open an old wound. If I harmed them, there is a wound. If it's in the past, it's an old wound. In other words, every single situation requiring an amend contains an old wound. That's why I'm making amends. It's com that, that argument is complete nonsense, raking up the past, all of that sort of stuff. The fact is, if they're still pissed off, the missing piece, which might be necessary for them to not be pissed off, is your apology. The, uh, a couple of images I've heard people use it, this is not reopening old wounds. If you stick a knife in someone's back and they can't remove it because it's in their back, you're the one that has to remove it because you can reach for it. And the fact it's been in there festering for the last 30 years does not reduce the necessity of making it. It increases the necessity of making it. If you left your moldy trash on someone else's lawn last week, you need to clear it. If you left it on their lawn for 30 years and it's been festering and turning into this huge mound of trash... Again, the fact that it's old means there is even more necessity to act. If they're still upset 30 years later, boy, do you need to make this amend. Um, there are a couple of examples actually in the book that prove this point, that the, the other person's emotional reaction to the amend is not a factor in whether or not you do it. By necessity, amends are going to be if they're worth making, the situation is touchy and difficult. And they are entitled to have emotions. They're entitled to be angry. They're entitled to be upset. You're not creating the upset. You're bringing out upset, which is within them. If I'm over, over something and you bring it up, it, I'm not going to feel anything. If I feel something when you bring it up, it was inside the whole time. So this, the caveat in the second half of step nine, except when to do so would injure them or others, is about creating new harm by revealing new information, which compromises my ability to be useful or affects other people in some way. And we'll come to specific, we might come to some specific examples of that. A um, couple of points as well, a little vignette from um, uh, Dr. Bob. Uh, and this is, this is from a vision for you. Just as, uh, just as he thought he was getting control of his liquor situation, he went on a roaring bender. By the way, I always think that would be a wonderful name for, um, a, uh, uh, I can say this because I'm gay, again, lesbian AA meeting, the Roaring Benders group of Alcoholics Anonymous. Anyway, just as he thought he was getting control of his liquor situation, he went off on a roaring bender. For him, this was the spree that ended all sprees. He saw that he would have to face his problems squarely that God might give him mastery. 
One morning, he took the bull by the horns and set out to tell those he feared what his trouble had been. He found himself surprisingly well received and learned that many knew of his drinking. Stepping into his car, he made the rounds of people he had hurt. He trembled as he went about, for this might mean ruin, particularly to a person in his line of business. At midnight, he came home exhausted but very happy. He has not had a drink since. Um, so for Dr. Bob, there was none of, oh, I'm waiting for the right moment. I'm going to do this in God's time, which sounds so spiritual. That means not today. Have you noticed when they say in God's time, God doesn't seem to say anything to them between now and lunchtime. What they mean is I'm not even going to look at this one in God's time, my foot. Um, willingness is action. Willingness without action uh, is fantasy. Uh, Joe Hawk, God bless him, said, you know what willingness sounds like? And he made a knocking sound. It sounds like the, 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 your, your knuckles knocking on someone's door. That's the sound of getting people's answer machines. The sound of the email whooshing out of your send box. That's what it sounds like. Uh, when I did a round of amends, I think I had 78 names, something like that, on the list. I was about 15 years sober. I went out at Hammer and Tongs. Took me nine days to get through the list of 78 names. Um, I probably could have done that quicker. Uh, but nine days is not bad. Not as good as Bob doing it in one day. But that's the kind of time scale we're looking at. What does the text say? Um, so there are some wonderful quotations. I'm not going to read the whole of the big book on step nine, but I am going to read out some passages. Um, first of all, it talks about mentioning AA and spirituality. And it talks about, I'm not going to quote this, but it talks about uh, you don't want to prejudice them. Uh, but... It says, we don't use this as an excuse for shying away from the subject of God. When it will serve any good purpose, we are willing to announce our convictions with tact and common sense. One of the advantages in saying that I'm an alcoholic, I'm now sober, I'm in AA, I'm making it, we are on a spiritual path, we make amends. One of the advantages is it legitimizes why you're doing it. Because I don't know about you, but as an alcoholic, I would I would Apollo manipulate, apologize, manipulate my way out of lots of situations. Sorry meant please like me again so I can continue acting as I've always acted. Please like me. Look how wounded I am. Look how pitiful I am in my remorse. So you've got to be careful making amends that it, it, it's got to come across as credible. The quickest way of making it credible is do the whole AA shtick. Um, if you harmed them whilst you were in AA, don't mention you're in AA because you just look like a jerk then. If it's to do with drinking and using and like when you are out there, then it's legitimate. Um, the one problem is it, in work contexts, it just freaks people out. They think it's just weird, the fact you're mentioning this. It can be deeply inappropriate in work contexts. As I said earlier, British people can be very sceptical and cynical about mentioning spirituality. Um, and so one might be careful there. What you can do, the alternative, and I've used this, I say to people, I'm going through a process of systematically reviewing where my behavior has negatively affected others and I realize I've negatively affected you. This is also a good explanation for why you're apologizing 10 years later and not 10 minutes later. That's why. It explains why you're in touch after 10. It explains a lot of things. But if it's, it, I, I'm not shy really about mentioning AA um, outside. I, a lot of people have um, been put in touch with AI. I've been the first port of call because of amends I made. Um, someone therefore knows I'm in AA and they send people my way. So it can be very useful. Um, but in that passage, we're at the top of 77 if you're a page number junkie. Um, 
it says our real purpose is to fit ourselves to be of maximum service to God and the people about us. And this is the point. Um, step nine, it's not about uh, me feeling better. It's about establishing a more credible basis for me to operate in the world. If I'm running, if, if I'm running around with lots of enemies, I'm not going to be trusted. There, there are psychological aspects to it. I remember I, I screwed over a, an employer. I might tell this story later on for this time. I screwed over an employer in the city of London, and I had this kind of psychological aversion to this whole part of London until I made the amend and then the psychological aversion went. I hadn't realized this kind of cloud would descend on me whenever I approached that part of London. In case I saw, some, maybe unconsciously, I thought maybe I'll see the person from the office, blah, blah, blah. Um, I went to school in Germany for a while, and there are a bunch of amends I didn't make uh, until my second round of amends when I was a number of years sober. And again, I had a, a troubled and disordered re relationship with uh, the country, Germany. And it turned out that it was these unmade amends. I made the amends, the relationship from my point of view, normalized. Uh, you'll have to ask Germany what it thinks. But my side of that relationship was fine. So many weird, there are so many weird things that I thought was wrong, were wrong with me. There was nothing wrong with me except I had some amends to make. Um, no psychologist ever suggested making amends. And I saw a number of professionals uh, but I can't tell you how many little weirdnesses and complexes just disappeared when I just made the effing amends. Uh, nothing to see here. That's the great thing. You make the amends, there is now nothing to see. It's like those games where you've got two cards and you have to match them in pairs. And when you match them in pairs, the two cards disappear. It's like that, the harm and the amend. You match the amend to the harm, they both disappear out of your consciousness. Uh, sometimes people say, oh, I, I don't want to make amends to this person because they harmed me more. I, I was uh, in a sexually, in, when I was a minor, I was in uh, inveigled into a sexually inappropriate relationship with someone who's older. Uh, they, they, they were responsible in the situation. I had no idea what was going on. It was a horrible deal. It lasted four years. Uh, and it was very damaging. Uh, did they harm me more? I think I had you measure these things. I think so. But boy, in the last year of that, did I launch retaliatory measures, which were unkind and unnecessary. Was he a cad? Maybe, but also a human being. So uh, I made amends for that. And my relationships with men cleared up significantly after I made that amend. Who knew that would be connected? But it was. Uh, in the book, what it says is, the question of how to approach the man we hated will arise. It may be he has done us more harm than we have done him. And though we have, may have acquired a better attitude toward him, uh, we are still not too keen about admitting our faults. But it says it is harder to go to an enemy uh, than to go to a friend. We take the bit in our teeth. In other words, I'm not interested in the balance, like who harmed who more. I deal with my side. With this situation with the firm in the city, um, long story short, they screwed me out of some money. And so I withheld my uh, employment from them for two weeks. When the I was at the end of the contract. I, I'd, I'd already resigned at this point. And they paid me in the middle of the month. And it, at the point that they paid me, I discovered that an, another amount they promised me was not going to be forthcoming. And so I tied up loose ends and just walked. They had paid me for the last two weeks of that month, but I was not there. They did not get any work for that. Now, the two questions of whether or not they screwed me over the other amount and my withholding my work for the pay they'd given me are unrelated questions. I made amends. I wrote to them. I said, I, this is really embarrassing, but this is what happened. This is the amount of my pay. 
for those two weeks. I would like to give it back to you. Uh, they wrote a very gracious letter. They said, we don't want the money. We consider the matter closed. I had to write back and say, yeah, it isn't my money. Can you nominate a charity you can go to and said, so even if, anyone who says I don't want the money back, it's still not your money. It doesn't become your money because they say you don't have to pay it back. It has to go somewhere. So I found there was a charity that the firm supported. So the money went to the charity. I never got that bonus, but my conscience is clear because I cleared up my side of it. I don't get to stack up my harms against other people's. Um, very important in the amend. There are some very good guidelines. Uh, we go to him in a helpful and forgiving spirit, confessing our former ill feeling. You only do that bit if they know about it. You don't say, oh, by the way, I've hated you for the last seven years. Uh, if there's been open warfare, you can confess it, but it's not really a confession. With relationships where that's under the surface, under no circumstances, remember the context of that paragraph is making amends to an enemy where there's open warfare. It says, uh, expressing our regret under no circum under no condition to be criticized such person or argue um now there's an interesting line it says simply we tell him we will never get over our drinking until we have done our utmost to straighten out the past there are seven points in the big book where it says if you want to stay sober you have to do this or you have to not do this this is one of them what does utmost mean? It means that the step, step eight has to be complete. And uh, during the process, and certainly at the end, I sit down, higher power, piece of paper, pen, and say, God, show me every single relationship where there is unfinished business going back to the start of my life however trivial or minor it may seem to me, anything. And those are the relationships I get to look at. Now, in each of those, I systematically look at what was my behavior. If it was wrong, I make amends. If there was nothing wrong in my behavior, but it's simply a resentment of some description, then I've got the forgiveness. Sandy Beach says it, you, your, your two problems are either unmade amends or unforgiven wrongs. The two solutions are to make amends and to forgive the wrongs. In the 12 and 12, it says that defective human relations are the uh, root of all of our problems, including our alcoholism behind any relapsing or acting out is always there are always unfinished amends unfulfilled obligations ongoing harm there is a problem with defective relations also the amazing thing about this fyi and this is a thorny topic but um i've never had to address or solve or deal with a relationship problem in the last 29 years there isn't there are no such things as relationship problems i have behavior problems and attitude problems my behavior my attitude when i fix my behavior and fix my attitude poof there goes the relationship problem what i will do in my illness is project out all of my stuff onto this this me and this you and then i project all my stuff onto this thing called the relationship and i have a problem with the relationship and you have relationship counselors and then eventually if you can't solve the problem what do you do yet yeah, the relationships become like this goblin in the room there's you that's fine there's the other person who's fine and then there's the relationship goblin and of course because the, it, it's all fictitious if you can't solve it what do you do you shoot the goblin you get rid of the relationship you find a new one and you recreate all of the same you recreate all of the same crap with someone else uh, what I've discovered is when I completely forgive and when I make amends and then follow through with the fulfillment of my proper obligations, suddenly I don't have a problem in my relationships anymore. 
So that saved me a lot of time. So that's why I heartily endorse the notions of forgi <laughs> forgiveness and making amends because they've saved me all sorts of other, going down all sorts of other rabbit holes. Um, but -um, but -um, but -um. Most alcoholics, oh, oh, by the way, yeah. On this, bringing up the past and upsetting people because you're bringing up a painful thing. Now, it's very interesting. It, this is the book saying this. It should not matter, however, if someone does throw us out of his office. We have made our demonstration, done our part. It's water over the dam. So this is a situation where you make amends to someone. They are so furious with you that they throw you out of their office. The book does not say, oh, you shouldn't have raked up the past there. No, it says, good boy, good lad, well done. You see, the thing is, as an alcoholic, I think there is a problem with human emotion. I conflate emotion with harm. Just because someone else is having feelings does not mean they've been harmed. Feelings are not problems to get rid of. Because someone feels something, it doesn't need to be fixed. Harm now, there is an overlap. There is the unnecessary causing of emotional suffering. But this, but I'm, when I make amends to someone, if they're still angry, some people have, boy, they shouted at me. One bloke, 20 minutes, on and on and on, and, and you just let them speak until they're done. Shouted at me for 20 minutes. Saw him at a meeting a couple of weeks later, happy as Larry, never mentioned it again. And I've had that a lot. I mean, I've been such a jerk in AA. A lot of my men's are to people in AA. And they, their skin was crawling when I made the amend. There was one example. I better not say the name. Um, I, made, I, fi I, I finally pinned her down. I, I had to re really sort of Sherlock Holmes to, to, to grab her. Pinned her down and made amends. She wasn't happy. She didn't like it. But a funny thing happened at a meeting. She was sitting next to a newcomer. The newcomer said, I was doing the chair at this meeting. I felt so sorry for the woman I just made amends to. She was so unhappy seeing me sitting there, uh, arms crossed, scowling at me. But the newcomer nudged the woman in the, in the, in the what would that be, in the ribs, and said, I was going to ask him to be my sponsor. Is he okay? And she said, he's okay. So the fact that she hated me still was clearly irrelevant. I don't think she would have said that if I hadn't made amends because there was unfinished business there. Um, criminal offences. It talks a lot about that. It, it's all, Now, when, uh, lots of people have lots of criminal offences. I had a few. Um, this is one where there, there is a really legitimate question about except when to do so would injure them or others. Um, a lot of historical criminal offences from 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, um, often the person knew the situation was all out in the open. If they were going to prosecute uh, or call the police, they would have a long time ago. Sometimes the harm was known about, but the identity of the person was not known about. Another common one is uh, defrauding the benefit system, shoplifting. I mean, there are endless examples. I can't, there's no time to list them all. Now, the question is here. Um, you want to set this straight. Uh, you want to pay the money back. Things are very different in 2020 than things were in 1935, 1939. Lots of organisations have got mandatory procedures to bring criminal prosecution. They don't want to. Waste of their time, but they've got to follow their internal procedures. What happens if they do? You've got to think this through. And this is the deal with step nine. You take the proposed amend and you start to think through what would happen if... Um, 
a friend of mine. So, so, so for example, in this country, a lot, I know a lot of people that have gone to local supermarkets like Tesco's and Sainsbury's and admitted to shoplifting from 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. Fine. Um, Marks and Spencer's take a different attitude. A couple of people have started down the process. It was very clear that if they proceeded with the amend, it would have automatically triggered a prosecution. Now, this is going to take the company's time and money. It's going to take the police's time and money. It's going to take the court's time and money, um, uh, depending on what the crime is. There could be expert witnesses. There are lawyers. There are legal clerks. There are solicitor's firms. There are barrister's chambers. There's the criminal justice system. There are the people administering the community service. There's And who's footing the bill for all of this? The taxpayer. And you're potentially incurring tens, and if it's serious, kind of hundreds of thousands of pounds. So you can set, so you can set a right wrong. A wrong right. Well, I, the, the Freudian slip reveals what's going on there. Um, a friend of mine, I'll give you an example of how this can be dealt with. A friend of mine um, uh, defrauded the housing benefit people for, I don't know, ten, somewhere between 10 and 30,000 pounds. I can't remember the amount. And he, he was willing to pay it back over a number of years. Uh, he established with the local authority in question, so it's, he found out that if he were to admit to it, there'd be a criminal prosecution. He'd end up with a criminal record. He would be less employable, potentially dependent on the state for income, unable to support his wife and children. Lots of people involved. And so he did, and, and particularly the real question here, I think the family were. Were, were neither here nor there on that. I think they would have supported him either way. But the question is, if this is going to incur lots of money, uh, taxpayers' money, the advice, this is a friend of mine, the advice he was given was go to 10 people who are top-rate taxpayers who are paying at 40% tax and say, right, i got £30,000 here that I'm willing to give to a housing charity uh, to help house people in housing difficulties. Or I can go back to the housing benefits people, repay the 30000 and incur the cost of a court case on top. Which do you think would be more beneficial to society? All 10 said, give it to the housing charity. Those are the people who are ultimately affected. They stand in the place of the taxpayers who are ultimately affected. And it was a brilliant move because you are literally consulting people in the category who are affected by the amend. So with criminal, um, I, I know some people who've gone to, who've admitted to crimes and gone to prison, and they are very equivocal about whether it's the right thing. It, there is no one rule that fits everything, but these have got to be carefully thought through. And the question is, what is going to place me in the best position to be... Um, uh, to be useful to others? What is going to square my accounts with the universe? Uh, the, local, the local branch of Tesco's question is a very interesting one as well, I think. Um, if you do a proper step eight, you say, well, wh who has been harmed? If I've been thieving vodka bottles, um, I didn't thieve from supermarkets. I did thieve from other uh, other places and all of that stuff i by the way go around your flat or your house and identify any object that belongs or belonged to someone else and mail it back i found dozens of the things little things little things that sticky fingers had picked up over the years <laughs> mailed them all back anyway tesco's that's a supermarket if you're american or not Okay. Local supermarket, hundreds, hundred thousands of branches. Who suffered if you pilfer from uh, the local Tesco's? It's not the staff of the Tesco's. It's covered by their shrinkage, it's called. They expect that from an accounting point of view. It's not the manager. It's not the security guard. It's the shareholders of Tesco's. The people you owe the amends to 
are not the people who work in the shop. It's the people who are harmed by your theft, and those are the owners of the business. And so what people I know have done with that particular situation is uh, most of these big firms uh, uh, have corporate social responsibility programs where they give back money to the community, where they uh, 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 allow people to actively contribute to those schemes. So you find a way of volunteering or paying into those schemes, which directly benefits, the. apart from the fact it's benefiting the community, as opposed to incurring, uh, clogging up the court system, which is already clogged up, um, you're, you're going straight to the source, which is the organisation itself and the owners of the organisation. And my, my experience with this is, is uh, with my own criminal behaviour, um, uh, I had, there was one case where it would have ruined my father's reputation for it to have come out in the local town what happened. So I found alternative ways of making amends. A good example my friend Tom gives of a kid who stole lots of money from a gas station where he worked. And uh, I think there the, the, the decision was not to reveal his identity. It would have been new information. It would have upset the bloke to think that his employee he trusted had been thieving. Other people have different stories. I know Bob D has a very different story about thieving from a, an employer, but there are different experiences, and that's fine. In this case, the kid every day just mailed $10 in the post in an in a, in a <laughs> otherwise empty envelope. He got the money back to him. And it was dealt with. There are lots of ways of doing this. And each situation has to be judged uh, carefully in, in its specific context. Um, what else? I've covered most of these. Interesting line, a couple of lines. There is an example in the book uh, of uh, writing a letter to an ex-wife. It doesn't say you rush up to the ex-wife you know you owe alimony to. It says you write to her. Other examples of the application is second half of step nine. It talks about if you've been wild with uh, uh, other women. It, well, that's its example. Dear, tell your wife. Well, if she knows what you've done, you can admit it. But don't go into details. Don't bring other people into it. This principle of don't reveal new information is all the way through that chapter. I just want to give some other specific examples. Um, I had a very good friend when I was a kid in, in Germany. And we had a falling out when I was 18. And it centered, the last time I'd seen him was when I, when we were both 18, 19, and I'd been very drunk. I'd said some really inappropriate things and we never saw each other again. Now, I did not know at the time why uh, we didn't see each other again. You're 18, you're 19, lots of things just fizzle and people go in different directions. People end up in different countries, which we indeed did. But... I had this the most appalling guilt over what I thought I thought I'd destroyed this relationship and couldn't I couldn't find him couldn't find I lost track of him when the internet comes along I start trying to trace him nothing pretty unusual name but still nothing what I do is I keep my list of the unfindables. I think I looked at it today out of curiosity. I've got about eight, about eight people on the unfindables list now. But he was on the unfindables list. And uh, I was in a meeting a couple of years ago. And when something flashes through your mind, do something with it, Maybe. And his name started to flash through my mind again. I can't tell you how many hours. Once a year, I would spend an hour trying to find this person. I tried again. Doesn't matter that I'd failed, you know, once a year for the last God knows how, how many years. I, I paid money to uh, an American. Yeah, there are these services in America where you pay them some money and they do some tracing. And it came up with some information where 
I discovered there was a there were, there was someone with a similar name but with an extra barrel to the surname. And I went. To, I found a website which made reference to that person, and there was a piece of biographical information which suggested it could be the same person. And then I took the first name and the the, the new barrel of the surname, and with you know I spent about one hundred and fifty dollars, and I traced him, and I found him, and I made amends, and he had no recollection of the conversation. And I'm going to be seeing him in Vermont in about three weeks. <laughs> He's invited me and my other half of my best friend in New York to come, come spend the day. I'm going to be in New Hampshire. We're going to spend the day with him. This was a huge cloud over my life for years. But again, I tried again and again and again. I would keep, I keep those people, not constantly in my mind, but close enough. There was another case with a, a teacher at school. I was incredibly effed up. And there was a teacher who was incredibly kind to me and helped me with my one particular A-level I was struggling with, but also was my personal tutor. It was a boarding school, so your relation, they're, they're in loco parentis. So she, uh, she rather took me under her wing, but I lost touch with her. Similar thing, surname change, couldn't trace her. How do you trace someone with the surname Brown? I mean, really. But a situation arose on Facebook where I was in contact with someone that I knew from 35 years ago. And we talked about another teacher. And I contacted them through a chain of people. I finally found this person. We had this amazing dialogue by email, which extended over a few months. And I hadn't harmed her, but I owed her a huge debt of gratitude. And I owed her a follow-up to say it all worked out in the end. But she thought I was going to die. And she was so glad I found her. Um, Mark Houston talks about if you went to the top of the Empire State Building and, sh and slit open a feather pillow and shook it and let the wind take each of those feathers wherever it wanted in the world, step nine is going and retrieving all of those feathers. Impossible. Well, this was someone else's story, actually. Um, and the bloke's punchline was, it's impossible you can't find all the feathers. Mark Houston's response was, what if you have a personal relationship with the creator of all those feathers? Very good answer. And I found people I shouldn't have been able to find. Um, and just with a couple of other things. Um, when I was... No, 11, I was living in France. My parents shipped me off to all sorts of families who they did not even know. I mean, the whole notion of stranger, stranger danger just didn't exist in my family. Is a, oh, you're going to be living with the Ferreros this summer. Who are they? I don't know. They seem nice anyway. So complicated. Uh, I was living with the Ferreros um, in Paris and I left a window open. I shouldn't have left open and a cat fell four stories. It was an accident. I was 11. I didn't mean to do this. The cat survived. I had to have an operation. The cat survived. Uh, do I owe amends? Yes. Can I find the Ferreros? No. Can I find the... Well, oh, the cat is long gone. But uh, I, a couple of things. I made a lump sum an eye-watering lump sum donation to a cat charity to pay for a serious cat operation. And uh, I follow something on Facebook where there's this cat charity in Greece where whenever they've got uh, a, these cats that need, the, the, they look after these feral cats and they patch them up and new to them and, and, and so on on the Greek islands. And whenever one of these little cats needs an operation, I send them some money. I don't care that it's all more than the cost of what the original harm would have been. I don't care. I'm going to carry on doing that. That is the ongoing. It does not. Now, I'm clear with amends. 
I'm up to date, but as time progresses, my opportunity to round off those experiences uh, continues. Um, and one last point, for years, when I, and, until I made that first donation, large donation to a cat charity to pay for an operation, cats did not like me. When I made that donation, cats started running towards me. That's cats. Imagine the effect of making amends to human beings. Got problems with other people, problems with addictions, compulsions, intrusive thoughts, whatever it is. The obsessions of the mind, Chuck would call it. Maybe you want to revisit steps eight and nine. I bet there's something in there. That's all I've got. Over to you, Patrick. Thanks a million, Tim. That was really great. Just great stuff. So um, as I said earlier, uh, if you need a sponsor uh, at all, we have a sponsorship WhatsApp group. and We have a list of available sponsors. If you're willing to sponsor and want to be on the list, you can send me a direct message. For the male sponsorship coordinator today, we have Aaron on board, and he's a co-host in the chat. You can direct message him. Female uh, sponsorship coordinator is Vicky N. She's on board, too. So you can just send the messages or hang out after. And with that, I'm just going to turn it back over to Tim. And uh, just uh, it's a Q&A with Tim. And uh, keep it brief if you have a question so we can get everybody in. And uh, like I said, it's been recorded. And if you don't want to, your voice on the recording, you may send the, uh, the question directly to Tim in the chat. And he'll handle it that way. So back over to Tim. Thank you. And raised hands. Yes, or... I'm. Yeah, I'm just going to wait for some raised hands to come in, and if they don't, we can all go home. <laughs> uh, Vicky. Hi, thank you, Tim. Uh, small parenthesis, Patrick. Could you please make me a co-host because I was kicked out and came back again? The practical thing. Thank you, uh, Tim. Thank you for your share. Great as usual. Um, very. Simple question. I don't remember. I don't remember what I have done. Like my, I have missed half of my life, I think. And people come and, you know, give back the pieces. And uh, I, I really don't know what I might have done to people. So what do you do in that case? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, a couple of, uh, a couple of things. Um, I've been amazed at how much has come back over time. Um, there are a couple of other procedures, though. One thing you can do is to, uh, and I, I've certainly had these conversations, I've gone back to people uh, and said, um, like, particularly when I was drinking, to say, look, I know that I behave badly, but and I've done my best to analyze what went wrong. Um, but honestly, despite my best efforts, I'm at a loss. I really want to make things right with you. I, can t I know that I affected you. Will you tell me? Now, those are really uncomfortable conversations. And frankly, even when you think you can remember, half the time, you're, um, uh, you're, you're way off. I've, I was way off. In nine out of 10 cases, the unexpected happens. So all of the things which I, I, I need in my current relationship, the, um, the things I think upset him are not the things which upset him. Uh, there was one person, one ex of mine, where um, I made amends for a bunch of things. And I was, I'd, I'd not made amends to him before. Um, because the last time I'd seen him, the last time I'd spoken to him said, if I ever see you again, I'm going to kill you. So I don't want to make amends to him. It's a thing that people say. 
I mean, there are going to be situations where, you know, if the person in question is armed and dangerous and has killed people before, that might be a different situation. This was not, this was a, he was a German teacher, for heaven's sake. I mean, this, you know, from, from Yorkshire, um, you're not the killing kind. Anyway, um, I made amends, and I, it, it, I, I sort of don't want to disclose his story, but he said, no, the thing which really hurt me was X, Y, and Z, and I had no idea. And what he revealed, what he said in that conversation, revealed he'd, ca- he'd cared far more about me than I'd realised. Uh, so I think it's the norm that you can't remember. Uh, but I can still approach people. I can still do my... Uh, one can only do one's best. I'm sure there are lots of people that I have no recollection of their even existing, but I would make amends if I could. So, But the point is my consciousness being cleared of that. Um, another... A couple of great questions here. Um, Thank you, Tim. Thank you. So uh, my Al-Anon sponsor, this is someone reading out, my Al-Anon sponsor told me that as a child, I was not responsible for wrongs just because of being a child. Uh, well, it depends what you mean by responsible. Um, I'm not, it's not my fault I was badly programmed. That's true. Uh, my beliefs and my thinking were... I think it can be agreed, conditioned by the background, the environment, the family, all of those things. Fine. But how old is a child who's 17 years and 364 days? Is that a child? Is that not? We have this arbitrary cutoff at 18 or 16, depending on which country you live in. But um, but you get the point. There's an arbitrary cutoff, but that's for the convenience of the law. Um, I think it's certainly that when I was at school, when I was mean to people at the age of seven, I was asked to apologize. Quite rightly. Uh, When I was a kid, if I broke something or knocked something over, I had to clean it up. It's not someone else's job to clean it up. I had to clean up my mess. Step eight is not about, and nine, it's not about beating myself up. It's about taking responsibility for the consequences of my actions. My consciousness is unaware of legalism about who is responsible under the law, who is not responsible under the law. It doesn't care. It just knows I was malicious or thieving or whatever it was. Or sometimes I just... uh, Some amends... You're not making amends for being a bad person. You're saying, I need to, I want to recognize to you that I affected you very badly. When I was at school, I would, um, as I said, it was a boarding school. We were all living together. I would sit there with other people and I'd get a knife out of my pocket and hack my arm open in front of people. This will affect them. Did I do it because I was mentally ill? Yes. Did it affect them? Yes. Both can be true at the same time. And I've spoken to those people and I'm not, I'm so sorry for being mentally ill. That's not the, that's not the conversation. The con- conversation is that must have been really tough on you. Do you want to talk about that? And I regret the effect. I'm sorry for the effect that it had. But it's, it's a subtle conversation. It's not beating yourself up. And every situation is different. It has to be approached in a different way. Another question. Um, what about making amends? <laughs> well, this is, this is the $64,000 question, isn't it? Oh, I even want to answer this. What about making amends to yourself? Right. Okay. So... The amend is about my the amends about my relations to other my relationships with other people. There's only one of me, 
So I can't make amends to myself because there'd have to be two of me for the transaction to take place. Now, did my behavior harm my prospects, my well-being? Absolutely. But the amends to myself are the 12 steps. The the, the 12 steps uh, clean up the mess and set me straight. It's already covered. If I did, if I do all of the 12 steps, forgive everyone for everything, make amends to everyone I can find, live a life of service. That is the best thing I can do. It's already covered by the 12 steps. I'm very skeptical about solipsistic um, looking in the mirror and saying, I love you and all of those, all of those sorts of things. What I find is that how I treat other people mirrors back against me. So my negative self-talk stopped when I stopped mentally attacking other people. Funnily enough, that was the way around it worked. When I was trying to stop the negative self-talk without making amends to other people, it didn't work. And then when I made amends to everyone else, it stopped. So there was nothing There was no problem to solve anymore. My big realization at the end of step nine was, oh, my God, I'm okay." Boom. End of discussion. Low self-worth, gone forever. I may have a little bit of a problem with high (laughs) self-worth. Okay, I admit that. But low self also, let's leave self-worth to another discussion. Maybe that's a topic, Patrick. Um, But... (laughs) <laughs> I, I i don't i don't need to do it now if if you if you've done it and it helped good for you but it's just not part it, it a lot of this is the way you look at things is the door a push door or a pull door it depends which side of the door you're on so people can construe this in different ways and no one has to have an argument about it but that's that's what i do i'm just looking in the um Uh, this is yes this is a thorny question I'll, I'll, I'll read it out and see what happens uh there is a popular belief in my local aa community that if a man has not secured the consent of a woman in a sexual situation in the past he should not initiate contact with her to make amends because local aa women state that would be creating additional harm what are your thoughts um uh well this is a, this feeds into a broader question of uh Intrusion, aggression, stalking. I, uh, someone I once sponsored uh, lived on a council estate somewhere outside Warrior, I think Warrington, Manchester, something like that. And he'd been the local burglar. Like whenever, when anyone got burgled, it was him. He burgled hundreds of houses. He was built like a brick shit house, six foot four. The last thing that these people would want is him glowering on their doorstep. Now, he did deal with this. Uh, one thing that I've heard people do with uh, this situation, which has worked very well, particularly if the person is known, to write a sincere uh, letter. of a, It depends what the legal situation is, because there are thousands of situations here. Each one is different. But to write an amend letter and to give it to a go-between who makes the request and says, this is available if you want to read it. If you never want to see this person again, if you don't want to read the amend letter, let me know. I'll destroy the letter and tell him to hop it. So there are ways of coming at things. The the book talks about attacking things on the flank rather than risking a Mm face-to-face confrontation. And so very sensitive ones. Even recently, I've had sponsees where very nasty family situations and they've gone via someone to ask permission. And that seems to have been a way which approaches the person respectfully without having direct contact. And that can solve an awful lot of situations. Um, What else do we have here? What should I do about a friend I stopped talking to because their comments were mean and insulting? And for that, I don't want to talk to them again. 
good for you. I still want to make amends for stopping talking to them, but I don't want to continue their friendship. What would be the best way to go about this? Well, this is where, this is the genius of step eight. Column one, Tim, what did you do? Column two, what should you have done? Column three, who suffered and how? A few years ago, someone on the phone to me was aggressive and threat and threatened physical violence. Click. He got a click. <laughs> I didn't continue the conversation. I didn't continue the relationship. I sent him a message. Saying, I, I wish you well, but I don't want to have any further contact. Fine. Now, I did the right thing there. I mean, I can't judge your situation Oh, person who asked that question. I can't judge your situation. But when I've terminated an interaction or a relationship with someone for valid reasons, I've done the right thing. Now, if I've done it in a mean way, that's something else. Um, there are situations where I've made amends and I haven't wanted to... Uh, but you know, some people, you make amends to them and then they're like, let's move in. And you're like, let's never see each other again. Now, a good thing to do when, I, when I've got one of those kind of clingy, stalky, weird people is to, is to do the amend in writing nice and distant, say, I, I'm going to leave you alone. I don't want to interfere. I just would like to acknowledge the harm that I've done well, I wish you well and good luck with the whatever. So there are ways of making amends, but, it, but this is the key thing. I can only make amends if I believe that what I did was wrong, such that I can say I shouldn't have done it. I regret doing it. If I don't regret doing it, even if it causes suffering, I can't make amends. Best example. So I a teach at a university is one of my jobs and I fail people and it, it, they're, they're, they, they've worked for this master's degree and because of my mark, they don't get the master's degree. This causes real suffering, but I shouldn't pass people if they haven't achieved the standard. So I don't owe amends to people for that harm caused because I did the right thing. Uh, Molly, do you want to come in with your question? Hi, um, Tim. Thank you for your share today. Um, so I have a question. I got pregnant when I was 16 and then I started, I was on welfare and then my parents helped me for a long time. And then I had bad relationships and I had this narrative um, that I'm entitled, that I'm a victim um, and that everybody needs to help me. And now I'm 46 and now I'm realizing that that was my narrative and that I used people's, like the government's, I mean, maybe some of it was helpful because I was a single mom, but um, I, it's just, it was just too much of a narrative and a lot of it was harmful, especially to my parents. And now I'm feeling, I'm working, but I am feeling like what you said about the cats. I'm feeling like that with money a little bit. Like sometimes there's a resistance with money, but I feel like it would cost so much to make an amends and I have to make money to even figure it out. And it feels like this overwhelming thing. Yeah. Okay. That's a, that's a really, really, really good and helpful question. Uh, and there is a, there's a pretty standard answer. So with, uh, I paid back my parents for all the money that I cost them during my drinking. Um, the standard procedure that a lot of people follow is this. You calculate how much it is and you split it between debts that you owe where the people know you owe the debt. Uh, and that splits out between the people who are coming after you and the people who are not. The credit card companies are coming after you. Your family are kind of good with you having had the money. They were happy for you to have the money. Uh, and then you've got impersonal ones like the state and other organizations. I think the helpful thing to do is to write it all out so you know what the truth is and then say to God, you guide me on how best to deal with this. Um, 
and to do things in order. So to, with financial amends, pay the, to, the, 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 the people that are going to take your TV away or your car. The people who are going to take your car away if you don't pay them, then you can't work, then you can't pay them. They need to be dealt with first. Um, with the family stuff, with all the other stuff, with paying that back, uh, sometimes the way people pay back uh, with with that kind of huge amounts of money going in, particularly from the states, to say, well, what I'm going to do, I'm going to be sponsoring so many people to get them out of that trap themselves that they become members of society who give back. That is my amend. So fi- just because it came in financially doesn't mean it has to go out financially. If you're sitting on five million, you need to pay it back. If you're not, you're in a crappy job. You're just about getting enough money to pay your health insurance so that you, you don't die if you get sick. That's it. You've got to look after yourself and not be crazy. So there needs to be, it's not black and white. There needs to be some prioritization it's in God's hands. You let God guide that. Um, there's a question here. What do you, what if the person you need to make amends to is mentally unbalanced and likely to attack? You do it in writing. Next question. Um, I don't go and physically see people who are dangerous. Um, there's no need. Um, how do I make amends to people I live with and when the behavior I need to make amends for is ongoing? For instance, I have anger, anxiety issues and caretake for an elderly parent who I snap out every now and then. Do I make living amends? I have no control over my outbursts as of now and every promise of amending behavior comes across as hypocritical because because it is repeated yeah so this was a thing in my family we're a little bit short-tempered the advice i've always been given is to amend my the my behavior has to stop first uh people get sick of the apology they're now waiting for the changed behavior so my job is to look at improving my relationship with my higher power to enable me to pause a hell of a lot more and the other thing as well that i've had to do there are people i was in i sponsored where i just i would find myself so (laughs) triggered it's my responsibility I'm not trying to blame them, but whatever it was, I was not at a level where I could deal with them patiently and tolerantly. So I withdrew from that situation. I got a very complex situation here because it's a parent that you have to care of. And I got, I understand, I understand that with, I've got a, a, a very elderly parent. Um, so there's a process, there's a process there. But the, the most important thing for me, if I'm treating people badly, is to do everything I can in my program to improve my behavior. That's the absolute uh, priority there. Um, uh, just seeing if there are any other questions. Uh, Danny H., would you like to come in? Hi, yes, thank you. Um, And I think, I don't know, it might be chicken or the egg question and probably lack of faith, but um, similarly to what you've been talking about, I feel um, I've been resisting making an amends to some family members where I have a fear that what they're going to, like, I know I need to be open to hearing what would make it right with them. And perhaps I'm projecting this, I don't know, but I'm afraid that my behavior, I won't be able to follow through with changed behavior for what they're going to request for me, like showing up more and being more um, like responsive. They're also like a little bit overbearing. And I know like it's a mix of like my own fear and my social anorexia, but also um, they're, they're very intense people and they're not in recovery and they're very like, I don't know. I'm afraid that I'm not going to be able to kind of follow through with what would make it right for them in terms of me showing up. So do I wait until I feel more like strongly in showing, like, do I practice the change behavior with them before making amends or do I like just have faith that my behavior will change after I make the amends? Like what is your experience with like, feeling ready to make an amend 
Thanks. Yeah. You, okay. You, you've got a, that's a good, good set of questions. You've got a com- complex set of situations there. Part of it, what I'm intuiting through uh, between the lines there is you've got a family who um, on occasion may make demands which are unreasonable or difficult to follow through on. And you've got some. Um, yes, I, I should have one reason. more thing that might make a difference. Yeah. too. My other yeah. I forgot. My other question was. So I've been, I had relapsed in past years with alcohol and drugs and I never revealed that to them. They haven't really asked, but I'm also curious. I know that probably part of my resistance is not being sure whether I should reveal that to them, not as an excuse for my behavior, but to be fully disclosed. So that's another kind of dynamic there. (laughs) Thanks. Yeah. Okay. So that's okay. So it's an extra complexity. Um, Make a distinction between honesty and candor. Candor is letting everything out. Honesty is being straight in your dealings with people, and they can overlap. Being straight in your dealings with people can sometimes mean telling the whole truth, but discretion is the better part of value. Uh, A friend of mine says, uh, when your parents ask you how you are, they don't really want to know. They just want to know you're okay. And he says, it took me 50 years to figure that one out. And that's true in my family. Now, you've got a, the, one of the problems. My, a friend of mine, acquaintance of mine, used to be a friend, been downgraded. An acquaintance of mine <laughs> once said that um, until you apologize, the behavior will find a way to repeat itself. And it's only by bringing the behavior out into the open uh, which makes it real somehow, that that's what enables you to stop doing it. That's been my experience in lots of cases, that it's only when I apologize, I find myself unable to do it again. Now, if you're in a pattern where it keeps going, um, uh, what I said earlier, I think counts. So one has to change the behavior first, let the behavior do the talking. Um, but you've got a complex situation there. There are too many factors to give a simple answer to, but those are some general broad brushstroke answers. I hope that helps to some extent. Uh, Michelle, you've got a question. Hi there. Thank you for the, for the meeting, Patrick. Thank you for um, being here, Tim. Um, it's been really interesting. Um, I made amends about, I don't know, about eight years ago to my mother and I spent a long time writing everything down and I was, I'd psyched myself up for it. I was really ready to kind of, um, because I was, because my intention was right and my intonation, the way I was saying it, the, the intention behind it was all correct at that time. And I went to see her and I was, I was ready for it. And I said, look, mum, I need to make my amends to you. You know, I'm in this 12 step program. And she just said, just being in the program is enough. You don't have to make any amends to me because I know that you're doing the right thing for you. Sorry, but I just found that so um, forgiving without even saying anything. But I actually wanted to say everything because it would help me. But And I did say to her, I'd really like to go through them. And she said, no, you don't need to. Just just by doing the program, I see you're changing and, you know, that's enough amends for me. So it's more of a statement than a, than a question. But um, as well, I, um, I'm meeting somebody next week who I tried to make amends with twice in the past, but she just didn't want to. She just dropped me and I don't know what the hell I've done. I really have no idea. All I know that, that you know, I was dropped like a, a hot coal. So um, I'm going to meet her next week and figure that one out because I have no idea but I'm open to suggestion so um yeah I just wanted to share those things yeah I just like to thank you Michelle I just like to comment on one aspect of that um what happens if they don't want to hear it again there is no single answer uh Tom Iverster very good speaker he's very elderly now I think he's still with us but he'd be in his 90s mid 90s He said there are people that he had to grab them by the lapel and say, I really need to say this. But that can be, you see, you've got a different situation with a family member than, let's say, an old business associate or something where they're never going to see you again anyway. 
particularly with family, I had to be extremely discreet with the way I did it with my mother. Uh, I haven't got time for the whole story here, but I was not going to spill guts with her. It wouldn't have been remotely appropriate. There was a time before I made amends that I saw her twice a year, and it was incredibly fraught. Now she's in her mid-90s. I see her over 100 times a year, and we wheel her around London, and we look after her, and uh, that's how that's turned out. Uh, But maybe the the full conversation about that is for another day. But uh, certainly if I ask, they say no, I say, I really want to, they still say no, that's when I stop. So you don't push beyond the, you don't push beyond the second request. Um, uh, CL, (laughs) maintaining your anonymity there, CL, I know who you are, but. Uh, Hi, Courtney, uh, uh, Tim, this is great. And I really, uh, it's it's a convention I went down just for eight and nine. Um, I know that my eight and nines are, I'm going to make you repeat yourself maybe a little more specifically to terminal uniqueness in terms of memory and loss of it. Um, so, you know, these events have been presenting because I can't, I can't, I can't remember so many things. And just to give you an example of how bad the memory is, um, I have a man, I'm, I'm a musician. I have a manager, um, I went to see another client's content, uh, concert and he points to this woman and he has two clients, me and somebody else in recovery, points to this woman and he goes, I, I know you guys do that immense thing. You, you need to go over there. Like she, you know, she told me I shouldn't even be managing, blah, blah. I'm like, sure, no, got it, got it. Because I've been making a few of these lately and they've been presenting. I faced this woman. I worked with her. It, the penny drops. I worked with her for 18 years, had no memory. Um, it's a thing some people get where like just they don't remember faces and then as I'm looking in her eyes I'm just doing a rote amends and then I'm like oh Jesus Christ she was my booking agent for 18 fucking years um, like that's how bad my memory is and I you know I got some really great um, steps eight step eight step on like absorbing people's time being a nuisance all that shit but memory you know, I've been trying to get this for so many years. And if you could just readdress that again about memory, because, man, I don't know. You know, I, I don't know. I don't remember. I'm looking at this woman. I worked with her 18 years, Tim. I, I, and then I realized, oh, I don't remember. I don't even know what I did to her, but I'm sure it was lots, right? And so made the amends. She was happy, but I don't remember things like that. So if you could, if you could address that again. I really appreciate yeah, so it. Just, just to summarise that, because I've said a lot over the last hour and a half, uh, you do your best with step eight. In the conversations, you invite them to fill in the blanks. When they're good, they say, we're done. You let yourself be done too. Because you've done what you came to do, which is to to set your relationship with them right. It ain't about the detail. I mean, obviously, don't throw the detail out of the window either. It's about the willingness to operate like an adult in the world, to admit where you've done something wrong, to attempt to clear up clear up the mess. It's the demonstration of goodwill which undoes this perception of there being a a sort of electrical link between you and the other person where you're constantly giving each other these these little electrical shocks. It neutralizes that and restores both of you to an equilibrium where you're good now. So, and this actually speaks to a couple of the other ones with uh, that it's the restoration of good relations with others. That I think that is what this is about. Uh, now, sometimes without the apology, this was a Don P principle. Um, he would say, uh, we can move on from this. I just need you to admit that you're wrong. If you can admit that you were wrong and you shouldn't have done whatever it was, we can move on. Until that's done, we can't move on. And I'm like that. I'm exactly like that as well. I understand that 
very clearly. So the important thing is how you then live, how you then interact, what you then give back to the world. But the key in the lock is the admission of the wrong. Now, it's going to be a shit show if you can't remember. <laughs> but as I say, your expression of goodwill, their acceptance of that draws a line under it, then you're good to move on. So, Patrick, you've gone over time. I suggest we stop there. Do you want to do the wrap-up? Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.